if a ship is unlawfully dumping, if they're putting their oil in the ocean and that ship comes to the United States, there are records aboard most ships that are going to allow criminal investigators to piece the crime together. This officer is going to review your chart and some other bridge items, and okay. I'm going to review the uh, oil record book. Okay. The oil record book that they maintain on board, it's really to show where oil's going from the time that they take it on board the vessel to the time it's off. It's like following the money. So we want to follow the oil. We want to make sure that every, just about every ounce of that oil is accounted for. Obviously, nobody's writing down, we're dumping overboard today. One of the early cases that I prosecuted was Royal Caribbean one of the largest cruise ships in the world, cruise lines in the world. And the Norwegian engineers had a name for this book. They called it the Eventerbok, which in Norwegian meant the fairy tale book, because it was a book of lies. It wasn't the book of the truth. And when you come to the United States, this is a condition of port entry. You can't have a ship that doesn't have this book. So if you come here, and your oil record book has been falsified. It's missing all the overboard dumping. It doesn't have it in here. The people who are responsible for that will go to jail. And the company that's responsible for that is gonna pay a huge fine. Right, it was over almost 12 hours. Oh, that was the stop time. Right, you start at 0835. Yes. Okay. And that was your stop. position at stop yes. time, right? Yes. Essentially for us, if somebody comes across oily water, we could see if they pass in that area, if it's a possibility that they discharged oil. Every oil has a unique fingerprint. Right. If we match it up, it's prison time for someone. It's hard to think of any other industry where there's an environmental crime that's so prevalent, so common. On ships, there's often a culture that not anything that I could possibly do would injure the ocean. But we know that it does. Oil is widely distributed in the environment. But in the midwater, in the center of an ocean, you could expect the chemicals to be as low or perhaps lower than almost any other place on Earth. So what's happening in this area? And this, we are very interested in determining. If ships, for example, are passing over the center of the North Atlantic and should happen to discharge oil of some kind, some of it could fall through the midwater. So one could ask, do you fish in this midwater region? Can you tell me if you've been exposed? And lo and behold, most of them we looked at showed us a change that would suggest they have been exposed to some chemical. So now the question is, can there be bad effects as a result of the exposure for many kinds of chemicals when they are taken into the body the body has a way of reacting, and that reaction is by making more of the enzyme that will metabolize those chemicals. It happens largely as a way for the organism to protect itself. This enzyme is the principal one that is produced in response to exposure to oil. With an enzyme like this, things move in and out. Here the change would take place, and that change can be carcinogenic. The irony is that the transformation of something like benzoapyrene by CYP1A is referred to as a double-edged sword. It cuts two ways. One is protection, and the other is damage that can result from the metabolites produced. What's really becoming clear to scientists is that there is no place in the world now that is pristine because we are putting in every day toxins and oil and other pollutants into the water. Those are spreading throughout the oceans. So there's no pristine place left anymore. The problem with oil pollution that occurs continuously is that the organisms never have a chance to recover.
the first birds are, are just starting to, about one yard out. Keep down. Just stay here. Everybody stay down. The bird just moved back to about uh, 20 yards or so from the catch area. Barry, some just come very close now. They're moving in. Okay, the net's in. Three, two, one, fire. Got the lock. Push, push, Then pull the protect out from behind you. Pull the protect out. Mod box. Absolutely bomb. We study the red knots because they're a vulnerable species. Their populations have declined dramatically in only 30 years. Is this a knot box? The numbers that used to go through Delaware Bay were over 100,000. And now there's maybe 15,000 to 20,000 going through Delaware Bay. And some people say it's even less than that. Red knots stop in Delaware Bay because it is the largest concentration of breeding horseshoe crabs on the East Coast. With every high tide, the horseshoe crabs come in and breed, lay eggs, and those eggs become available. Whenever the populations of any species decline dramatically, it indicates that there's some problem with the ecosystem. It's our task, really, to figure out why have they declined? In what place are they facing most threats? And what are those threats? This is new. The capture was at 16.30. Larry is the bander. So the red knot, although it's a bird that many people have never heard of before, it's an indicator of the health of the ecosystem. They might tell us something about whether the chronic oil that's in the water is causing a problem. They might tell us something about whether the food supply is OK. And ultimately, they tell us whether we need to be worried about the environment that we live in, because we're part of that environment. But that's light. That's going to put a lot of weight on it. Well, yeah, it's almost it got to get, a double. Uh, yeah. That bird has to almost double before yeah. it's going to leave. Right. Now, we've got to find out where that geolocator yeah. is. By putting those geolocators on the red knots, we are able to get a record of every place that bird has been in the year since we saw it last. We tagged the bird in Delaware Bay, which is right here. And from here, the bird went up to the Arctic, looked around for a place to breed. That's why it's not only in one place. And then it came back, went around a storm, all the way down to Cerro del Fuego, stopping only once. And then on its way back, it stopped once here and a couple times here to get back to Delaware Bay where we recaught it. If there was not enough food in Delaware Bay, in all likelihood, the birds would not gain enough weight to be able to successfully reach the Arctic. So they may either perish because they starve, or they may not be able to breed that year. And the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is considering to move it to a endangered status.